Hi, I'm Kristen, and this is the Simple Handmade Everyday Podcast, where I talk about living a creative, intentional life. I like to chat about quilting, sometimes knitting, what I'm reading and watching, and a little bit about keeping a cozy, organized home. You can find me online at my blog, Simple Handmade Everyday, on Instagram at Kristen Esser, and now we can keep the conversation going on a Simple Handmade Everyday Facebook group. I've got my cup of tea in hand, so let's settle in for a chat. This is episode 37. Welcome. I'm so happy to be back. It has been a little bit of a crazy couple weeks since uh, we last chatted. You may have seen on the news that Southern California was kind of on fire last week. (laughs) And um, two of those fires were actually very close to where I live. Um, We were never really in danger, but I will say that... um, I was packed to evacuate and they did a, do a mandatory evacuation not too far. I don't know. I want to say half mile, but it may be further. Let's just say a mile away from the house. And uh, so it was a little bit scary. I actually had contacted my kids who are at college and said, okay, if we evacuate, is there anything in your room that you want me to take? Mostly what they wanted was uh, was yearbooks. And so it was very interesting. I made a list on my phone of just all the things, you know, in case I got panicky <laughs> <laughs> that if, if they, we were told to evacuate, I could quickly just throw everything in the car. I didn't think it was going to happen, and it didn't. But, you know, I figured it was good to be good to be prepared. Um, we were actually very lucky because quite a lot of our town, um, were, there were power outages, and uh, we never had that problem. So just very happy. It was just a very unsettling um week. Uh, school was canceled. My husband's work was canceled just because the, the fires were too close. The air quality was bad, things like that. It, it actually, what was kind of weird is that because we get these things called the Santa Ana winds, because of the way the winds were blowing, it was actually blowing the smoke and ash away from us. So if it weren't for the news and the sirens and the helicopters <laughs> dropping water, I wouldn't have necessarily known that the you know, there were fires so close. So, you know, it's, it's fire season here in Southern California. What we really need is some rain. I don't think it's coming, but it would be nice if it did. Um, so I've got a fun podcast for you today. I hope, first of all, I want to mention that I started a simple handmade everyday Facebook group. It's a closed group where we can kind of keep this conversation going. A lot of people say, um, about my podcast that it's like chatting with a friend. Although, did I say this another one? Another one of the reviews said it's like, um, it's like chatting. It's like listening to my mother talk. <laughs> and I told my son, Ben, that he goes, yeah, I feel the same way. <laughs> I may have told you that story before. Anyways, um, but it's a one-sided conversation. So this is a way where you can chat back and I can find out what you're working on and what's in your cup of tea and how you're using your 15 minutes to, um, you know, do get do things that you don't want to do, like housework or, um, you know, chores and just things like that. So please, um, I will put a link in the show notes, or you can just search on Facebook. It's just called Simple Handmade Every Day. It's not the um, page that I have for the the podcast and the blog. It's a group. So make sure it's a, you're looking for the group, not the page. So, but I'll put a link in the show notes. So I'm excited about that. Um, we've got a l- small group of people in there now. And, um, you know, we're just kind of, you know, just getting to know people and people are just chiming in on various things. So it'll be fun. So please join us over there. Um, what I have in my cup of tea today is a Harney and Sons Darjeeling, which is a black tea, but it's a little, I don't exactly know. I should have looked it up what it is, but it's, it's a little bit, it's a milder black tea. And, uh, it's, it's just kind of nice when you don't really want the big, you know, kick that a cup of true black tea will give you. Um, speaking of tea, I mentioned, uh, several episodes back that my, British friend Pam was going to visit us on the podcast and teach us how to make a proper cup of English tea. And so we recorded that a little bit ago. So I'm going to insert that. (laughs) And it was super fun to record. And um, yeah, I just I hope that you all are a little bit interested in how to make a proper cup of English tea. So let's get started on that right now. Today we've got a special treat for you. My good friend Pam, who's a real life Brit, is here <laughs> to teach us how to make a proper cup of English tea. And believe me, she has thoughts on the subject. So um, join me in welcoming Pam. Thank 
you, Kristen, for inviting me over. I'm happy to come and teach you how to make a cup of tea. <laughs> Great. Okay, so first, where where in England are you from? I can never remember. Well, that's actually a complicated question because my dad was in the Air Force, so we moved around all over the place. I was actually born in Germany, but my parents now live in Ipswich, which is in Suffolk. Okay. So do you, would you say you have that kind of an accent? A, a su- Suffolkian? <laughs> Suffolkian accent. Well, I don't think I do have a <laughs> Suffolkian accent. <laughs> Let's make up new words. <laughs> okay. So my grandparents were from Liverpool and my dad was from Northern Ireland. So I think I'm a mixture of all sorts. I don't oh, it know sounds where like I'm it. Okay. located all right. accent wise. So... Um, Pam made us a pot of tea in my kitchen. We thought about recording there, but we decided it would be too noisy. So let's start at the top and just explain, as if I know nothing about tea, how to make the perfect cup of tea beginning to end. And I will no doubt interrupt you and ask some questions. Okay. Well, the first thing you need to do is you need to have a kettle of some description. You have one that goes on the stove and whistles but I actually have one that's an electric kettle either would do but you need to start with owning a kettle okay okay I've noticed that in Europe that everybody seems to have the electric kettle they do why is that it takes up counter space it takes up (laughs) counter space but I think they just make a lot of tea it's maybe a more common appliance than having a coffee maker so I guess it replaces that ah okay all right, so kettle to boil, and that's just to boil the water. Yes. Okay. I've noticed that some people in America have hot water taps, and that doesn't quite make it to the correct temperature. I think that comes to something like 200 degrees, whereas you need it to go to a full boil, which is 212 degrees. Okay. So it's important make- that it's boiling. Very important that the water is boiling. Okay. 212 degrees. Okay. So we got boiling very, water now. Very, very important. Yep, we have boiling water. The water that you put in the kettle has to be completely fresh. So every time you make a new kettle full of water, you should So put don't new don't just keep reheating it. the same water over and over all day. Yeah, <laughs> okay. it starts to taste a little bit chalky or I don't know, maybe it, it depends how hard the water is yeah, how much. Which is very hard here. The quality so. of the water. Okay. And then the next thing is if you're making a pot of tea, which is common if you're making more than one person's tea then you would have to warm the pot up so when you first brought the water to the boil then you need to pour some hot water into the pot and hold the sides to make sure kind of swish it around so it touches all the sides okay so if you unlike in my house but if you had a hot water tap could you just while the water's boiling you could just fill it with some hot water and let it sit while the water's coming to a boil yeah you too. could do that because it's i guess the point is that so you're just... not wasting heat when you yeah. first pour the water in to heat up the actual pot that's exactly the point. so and the water stays hotter yeah and the water the tea will brew better if you have boiling water really hot water okay so heat the heat the pot up which mm-hmm. i forgot about I, I consistently forget to do that so i was glad for that reminder okay Then you've got to, um, well, we made today, we made loose leaf tea. Yes. So I think it's about knowing the tea that you're using, actually, because I had difficulty when I came here today because I didn't know the Fortnum and Mason tea that you had. And I know how many I would put in of my normal tea, but not of that one. So I think once you own a tea, you've got to play around with it. Play around with it to get it to your own strength. In coffee, there's a specific ratio. Like it's two tablespoons to six ounces of water or something. But for tea, that's not really true. But in general, I've heard it's like basically a teaspoon of tea for a cup. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, that's the place to start. And for a pot, you do the however many, like I have a very small little Le Creuset one that's basically two cups of tea. right so we did two plus a li- one for the pot a little extra for the pot so this in quotes in for the pot yes okay that's true so yeah in general it's like a heap teaspoon per person and okay. then one for the pot but again it depends on how strong the tea that right. you're making and this is. tea the, the royal blend for mason was surprisingly a little weak you were saying so i thought it was quite a weak tea yes. yeah okay all right so we put it in put the tea in the pot 
Yep, we put the tea in the pot and then you asked me about how long to leave it in for. And I said, till it's done. Till it's done. <laughs> Not <laughs> helpful, Pam. <laughs> and what I do to check if it's done is I don't really have a time. I have a colour. So we left it in for three minutes. Which is my general time that I, that's like my go-to time, but then... Okay, and then I have a teaspoon, which I keep next to the teapot, and then I will take the tea cozy off and take the lid off and have, take a teaspoon of the The liquid liquid in the teapot and see what colour it is. Right. If it doesn't look strong enough, I will let it brew for a little longer. Right, so we debated quite a bit about how to describe these (laughs) colours. But basically, if it looks weak, keep going. So we went for another couple minutes, which, by the way, I will say that the back of the Fortnum Mason tin said five minutes. And you know what? I think they were right. (laughs) Yes. So um, it's a very nice cup of tea. It is, actually. Um, So, so yeah, so you just, you check until, and you, I guess, can figure out for yourself, you know, how, what color of tea do you like? Just like the same thing with when you put cream in your coffee. Like, mm-hmm. do you like it to be very light or just barely off of black? Or you, you figure that out yourself. Right. And I would probably have a different preference than, like, my husband and someone else in England might have a different right. preference for how strong they want it. Just like coffee. Yeah. Okay. All right. So you, we check it uh, and you go, oh, you, you proclaim it is the proper color. <laughs> okay. I proclaimed it's the proper color. And then we used a loose leaf tea. So obviously we have the leaves... In floating the, around, in, floating the around in the pot. So then the next thing is you need a tea strainer to pour it into the cup. Now we put the milk right. <laughs> in inverted commas <laughs> okay. into the, the, the uh, cup first. Right, and okay, so it in with the strainer. We'll, we'll get to, to the milk. <laughs> it will, it, okay, if you're putting milk in your tea, you do it first. You do it before you pour it in, before you... I don't think that matters, actually. Because I I feel like people have really strong opinions about this. They do, but I don't think it matters You were saying, another time we talked about this, that if you add it later, you can judge the color better, like putting cream in your coffee. And some people will take it black, so if you're serving guests, then... You wouldn't want to put it in a head. You wouldn't want to necessarily put it in a head. But then it mixes while you're pouring. It mixes better, right. I I don't know. I read something once that they started doing that because they used very fine bone china. And putting the oh, milk take in first off, takes the heat away so it doesn't crack the china. So I don't know if that's true. Okay. That may make sense. Actually. So so you, we pour it through. Put, we put the milk in first, poured it through the strainer. Okay, so let's sidebar here with a hugely heated debate about <laughs> the type of milk. <laughs> it's not really a debate, Kristen. <laughs> it's not. I'm just wrong. Okay, so <laughs> here's the thing is that we don't drink milk in our family, but we do have half and half. I mean, it's not like we don't drink it. Like It's just that nobody wants it in our house. And so I don't have milk. I have half and half that my husband puts in his coffee, and which I always thought was preferable to milk. Actually, Pam thinks that it is just the sludge. is <laughs> the worst thing in the world because apparently only milk will do in tea, so... Expound upon this. I agree it is the best thing in the world if you're drinking coffee. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Fair. (laughs) Okay, so... Traditionally, people in England would not have half and fat half. In fact, if people are listening in England, which they may well be, they will never have heard of half and half. What do you you guys call it? That's probably called single cream. Okay, so is it... But they they say cream and sugar. Is that just a coffee thing? So nobody says cream in England. It's always, do you want milk in your tea? Definitely don't put cream in tea. So, okay, so there's there's our cup of tea. So if you um, are going to make, is there any adjustments you make for if you just are going to make a single cup of tea? Well, if I'm making a single cup of tea just for myself and I'm in a hurry, I will just make it straight into the cup. But I I usually wouldn't make it in a cup. We're using bone We're china cups at the moment because i got but fancy i would have a mug a mug right a ceramic mug and i would make it straight into there with a tea bag with a and tea then you bag you don't have to faff around right with. okay so do you have thoughts about tea bags versus loose leaf tea or is it just about the quality of tea bags you like i mean i know that there can be very low quality tea bags which is why i like the loose leaf you know i drink a lot of tea so i think 
I'm quite happy with using tea bags just because it's easy, convenient. It is, yeah. Quick, and etc. And you buy a good brand of it, like. I usually buy Yorkshire tea, which is quite a strong tea. Right. Or I buy PG Tips, which is another right. popular brand. Right. That's I have that too. And I've had the Yorkshire. I think you gave it to me. And that yeah. tea, I've seen you make that tea at your house before. And I feel like you put the tea bags in, you pour the water on, and then you take the tea bags out. I mean, it's like, because it's strong, you do it super quick. Yes, that's true. That's, yeah. that's what I was saying about that depends on how strong the tea you're using is okay. for how long you brew it for. Because Yorkshire tea, you can get a pretty solid cup of tea after just a couple of minutes. Yeah, I feel like it was really quick. Okay. All right. So what other things do I have? What other questions? Do you have thoughts about lemon and sugar in tea? Lemon's like the half and half question. That's you don't put lemon. No, that's. I think that's for iced tea, isn't it? I don't know. I feel like I've Would seen put... on my, you know, my British shows that people put lemon only in black tea. But so yeah, for sure. For yeah, sure. for sure not. Oh, that would be horrible. Okay. Yeah. And... <laughs> half and half and lemon. Yeah. That would... It's an abomination. I don't even know if I could do that. <laughs> And I personally don't take sugar in my tea, but lots of people lots do. Lots of people do. Okay. And I guess there's an, another question there. Like, do you have sugar lumps? That's the Downton Abbey way. Yes. Or do you have a spoon? It, <laughs> I don't know. Does it matter? Does it matter? I think, I don't know. It's, they would have silver spoons, wouldn't they? <laughs> the little tiny tongs to put the, the tongs. Chloe and I just had, went to Camarillo, had the, the English tea, and we were very disappointed that the sugar was not in cubes. We mm -hmm. were like gonna put. We were gonna put sugar in our tea just for the novelty of it, but it was just regular, so we didn't. Do you know what? I they used to make us take immunizations. I think it was the polio vaccine that they took. You took or orally, and the doctor used to give it to you on a sugar on a sugar cube. cube. And it would not. Oh, nice. Nice. Okay, well, that'll ruin that. sugar for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, you didn't. I guess it was just sugar in those days. Um, okay, so my last question is. Do you think it's important when you have a cup of tea to have food that goes with it? Or can tea be standalone? Tea can be standalone. Oh, actually, a common thing to put with tea is biscuits. And by biscuits, I do not mean <laughs> the scone type biscuits. Right. I mean the dunking type biscuits. What like, you mean is cookies. But kind is it... of. Okay. But they have to be more solid than cookies. Cookies, the American type of cookies, would crumble. Okay. So there, you need like a hard. Biscuit. Okay. Are there? Is there another word for that? Digestives. Digestives is one type of uh, biscuit. Yeah, yes. which it just is the worst name for something you're going to eat, <laughs> in my opinion. <laughs> okay, but so, they taste so good. So do like, it, are, is there a brand that you can get in the U.S. of the proper type? Is like Biscoff? Like I feel like is a. As a cookie, yeah, that's that... a European type of a flavor. Yeah, yeah. Is there so any that kind of a biscuit, that kind of a yeing? Yeah. yeah. So you can buy those. those do kind you of buy? Do you buy yours. biscuits? Sometimes you're too Americanized now. I know. <laughs> well, and I don't want to put on too much weight. <laughs> true, true. You can't have a cookie every time you have a cup of tea. Right. So yeah, and you if you buy a whole packet of biscuits, right, you're going to eat the whole packet of biscuits. Right, so you've got to have guests if you're going to be okay. breaking out the biscuits. So it's not important that you have something solid to go with your tea. You're just no, but that's tea a nice fine. treat. It is, okay. So, actually, I just heard of a new Yorkshire tea flavour that they've just brought out. I, well, it could be that they've had it out for a while, I don't know. But it's actually a biscuit flavour tea. Oh, that sounds awful. Well, I'm going to buy some next time I'm in England. I don't I'm, like I flavored tea. It. I would think you'd be a tea purist. We didn't but talk the, about that flavored tea. What I've heard is that it tastes like having tea and biscuits. Like how your tea ends up tasting after you've dipped your biscuit right. in it a and few times. Right, and it's like malted milk biscuits, if anyone knows what that is. So it tastes like malted milk biscuits. So it tastes like you're having a treat. Yeah, but you're but it, not. But you're actually just having a cup of tea, so it's much better for you. All right. So... I'm going to try that. You next try time that, in but I'm going um, to bring you some too. Okay. Okay. <laughs> if anybody has any more questions that you would like me to relay to Pam, let me know. And um, otherwise, thank you for coming on the podcast. Okay. Thank you, Kristen. Before I move on to the quilting segment, I'd like to thank the Fat Quarter Shop for sponsoring the podcast. Fat Quarter Shop is a one stop show for quilting fabrics and supplies for quilters around the world. They stock quilt shop quality 
fabrics, pre-cuts, quilt kits, patterns, notions, and even cross-stitch supplies. They've just released the Quilt for a Cause Quilt Along for 2020. Have you seen it? It's called Bloomtopia, and it features Summer Sweet by Sherry and Chelsea. This sampler quilt combines unique historical blocks and a vintage style. You can reserve a kit at fatquartershop.com. This is how the charity quilt along works. So starting in February 2020, the Fat Quarter Shop will release two free patterns a month for six months. There's a suggested donation of $5 per pattern to the Make-A-Wish Foundation of Central and South Texas. The links are on their, their blog, which is called the, the Jolly Jabber. And what's really cool about this is Fat Quarter Shop and Moda Fabrics will match donations up to $20,000. So all you have to do is download the blocks, follow along, um, and make your donations. The designers of the quilt and the Summer Sweet Fabric line, Sherry and Chelsea, are going to be filming complimentary videos for each block as well. So very cool. I will put a link in the show notes and you can check it out. So let's talk quilting. I have been doing some sewing lately. I was really in such a funk over the summer, so it feels good to be back at my sewing machine. Um, not that I'm making tremendous progress, but I am sewing almost every day. I am still working on this sweet confetti quilt. It is in uh, Sunday Best Quilts by Corey Yoder and Sherry McConnell, who is the um, of Fat Quarter Shop fame over there, who's doing the who designed the Bloomtopia um, charity quilt and the fabric that they have it shown in. So. Um, yeah, I'm working on that quilt. And I have to say, I mentioned this, I think, in the last podcast, that I am definitely struggling with accuracy issues. Every block, um, I think the unfinished size of the block is nine and a half by five. So they're rectangular blocks, and then you put those together and, and they become square. Um, each one of those rectangular blocks has nine triangles in it. <laughs> So there are so many opportunities for things to get stretched out of shape. There are so many opportunities to be inaccurate, starting with cutting your squares, and then you cut those squares into triangles, um, sometimes just once, sometimes you cut it twice in the diagonal. And, um, you know, sometimes it goes really well, and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, you know, I, I, when I go to trim it up at the end, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I don't know how these are going to go together, so I'm a little nervous about it. So I've been trying to be really meticulous about my quarter inch seam and measuring as I go. Um, and the other thing that I've started doing is starching the fabric before I do the cutting. And that's not a step that I usually take. I, I often iron it just so there's not wrinkles in it, but I don't often starch it. But I do think that, and, and I'm talking starch with Niagara starch, <laughs> you know, which is like grocery store, you know, real starch. I do have, you know, flatter and, um, oh, what's that other one? Uh, Mary Ellen's Best Press. I have those and I really like using those under normal circumstances, but I do want these a little stiffer so that things don't get stretched out because there's bias edges everywhere here. So that's kind of the new um, thing that I'm doing. And I realized that I, what I did is I starched all the, 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 the print fabrics, but I forgot to starch the, uh, the background fabrics. And I'm actually, do you do this? Um, I am, okay. I'm cutting and sewing and cutting and sewing. I didn't, I don't do, I often don't do all the cutting up front and I'll tell you why. I make mistakes. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I made a mistake when I was cutting the, um, the background fabric. You needed a square of, I think it was five and seven eighths. And for some reason I thought it was five. No, you needed five and three eighths and I thought it was five and seven eighths. So I cut a bunch of squares and then I cut them on the dial. So I had a bunch of, of triangles that were too big. Um, it worked out okay because they were like the very last triangle so I could just cut them down to size but I actually I went to my husband who's the mathy one in the family and explained what I did and I'm like it's a right triangle right it doesn't matter that it's too big I can just cut it off and it's going to be fine right and he he uh, confirmed that yes that was true um, but I make mistakes so I like to just do a little at a time I also I don't like to cut I don't like to cut and I don't like to baste those are the parts of the the process that I'm not in love with. And so um, I like to just, you know, cut a few. So what I'm doing here is I've got 14 fat quarters of different prints from Minky Kim Someday line. And um, each fat quarter will make seven of these rectangular blocks. And so this will give me the 96 blocks I need, plus a little bit extra to, in case, you know, I just need to move colors around a little bit. And so I'm, I'm basically sewing, I was doing seven blocks at a time. I would do one fat quarter and just do all seven blocks, you know, in a chain piecing way for each of the 
the um, little units that go within the block. And now I'm up to doing it um, two colorways at a time, so 14 blocks at a time, which gives me a little more chain piecing time. And then I go back to the drawing board and I and I cut another couple fat quarters. So, um, so I was good about starching the fat quarters, but then when I ran out of my background fabric, I just went and cut some more. Then I'm like, oh, these are not stretchy. <laughs> these are more stretchy. They're not as stiff. So I'll let you know how that goes, but I do think that starching is going to really um, increase my accuracy. So what else is going on? Oh, I released, you may have seen, so the I did it that this uh, Irish chain quilt for the Loyal Heights fabric line from Lucien, um, designed by Quilting in the Rain. And I did that for her blog pop, uh, blog hop over the summer and if you follow me then you know that I was like totally eating my guts out over you know the type of quilt to design for that blog hop and I ended up going very simple and I, I purposely did something that had a lot of background fabric because I didn't even have quite a fat quarter of each of the the pieces of fabric and I really like how that um, quilt came out and so I I got a lot of um, emails about it saying, you know, do you have a pattern for this? And so I actually developed um, some very general instructions that I would just email whenever somebody um, asked me about it. So I decided to put it up as a free pattern on the blog. So you, I'll put a link in the show notes if you want to check that out. And um, it's not, there isn't a printable for it. I don't really... <laughs> Whenever I write patterns, I just send them to magazines and they make them look pretty. I don't know how to make them look pretty. So I just, you know, it's just in a blog post. It's such a simple block. It's just a nine patch where the center is bigger. So that's all there really is to it. But it does have the size of it and um, how I constructed it in a strip piecing way, which is going to go a lot faster than cutting a bunch of tiny little squares. So that's up there. And the response to that's been really good. I've had um, a quilt shop contact me asking if she could make it available to her customers or she had some customers asking about it and it was actually that um, email that just prompted me to just write that post and get it up on the blog um, I was just contacted by a quilt guild today that is going to use it as a swap so you know I guess other people like simple quilts too <laughs> so that makes me feel good because I was so nervous about that um I've been playing around with hand piecing some blocks for some um, some kind of projects that I'm working on. Um, I'll tell you one thing that I'm thinking about doing, and um, I haven't yet, is Sunny Day Supply is doing some sort of a Christmas stocking quilt along, which I'm not a part of, and I think it's almost over. But I keep seeing from people I follow on Instagram this adorable um, stocking that is with it's patchwork, and, and they're like diamond shaped. And they are so cute and people are often doing like hand quilting on them. And I think it's a little bit hard to put together because of the diamond shapes. I've not really done that before, but I'm just, I'm tempted. I'm tempted to pull out some Christmas fabrics and give that a try. And the reason this came up is that um, somebody who made one tagged me in it um, to say thanks for this, um, the basting tip. And I'd kind of forgotten about this. So I'm not sure if I've talked about this on the podcast or not. I know I mentioned it when um, I was interviewed on the, the Pat Sloan podcast, I don't know, a year or so ago. And, and I don't know, and other people probably do this, but I call it machine basting. So when you've got something, um, you know, especially a small project like that, but, or, but, a, but a quilt where you've got some kind of complicated intersections, um, you know, where you really want your accuracy to be perfect. I find that sometimes when I pin it, even sometimes I'll pin intersections two and three times. If there's a lot going on there, they sometimes slip and they're, you just can't, you know, by the, and by the time you've sewn the whole row, they're all off a little bit. And I can, and I do pin, I'm, I'm totally a pinner um, because I really do like my, my seams to, to intersect nicely. But um, I was doing this one quilt and I just had trouble with them slipping. So what I ended up doing is that I would get those seams, you know, like the two blocks meeting where I want them to meet and I would hold it tight and I would get in it under the machine and I would just do a few stitches right on that intersection and I'd go down to the next block and I'd do the same thing and I would literally just baste it with the machine and then I could look at it, pull it off the sewing machine, look at it and, and know that I'm happy with where those um, intersections are and that they look right. And then I would just go ahead and sew the whole, sew the whole row. It sounds like it, it's like laborious. Like, would you really do that under the machine for each time? I'm telling you, it's actually, I found it faster than pinning. 
<laughs> if you can hold it still and get it under your machine, and it really just really locks those um, those intersections down. So anyway, so I call it machine basting. I don't know if it's useful to you. Um, I would be very, you know, I'm, I'm happy to pass that on. The other thing that I've been um, thinking about, and I'm not 100% sure I'm going to do it, is the Bonnie Hunter mystery quilt. Have you ever done one of those? I would love to know and what it was like. I am pretty sure even if I do it, I will not do it on the given timeline, you know, during the holidays. And I know that she does that mystery quilt during the holidays because um, not everybody is overrun with family obligations. Some people are, they're, they're widowed or they're away from family. And she does it as, as sort of a gift to them to give them something fun to look forward to and fun to do during that time of year. Um, so I think that's very cool. But she released the color, the color scheme for it. And so what she does, she does these, um, she goes to Lowe's and she gets paint chips to, to show you so that you can bring them home and you can find um, fabrics that are in, you know, in that colorway. Of course, you don't have to do it in her colorway, but I really like her colorway this year. There's three blues and like a raspberry or a fuchsia and a spring green, which I'm not 100% sure about that one, but we'll see. And then um, some off-white neutrals and some white neutrals. And so I went to Lowe's and um, got those paint chips and uh, which was a little bit challenging at first till I realized if you do this, if you look on her blog where she's got the back side of the quilt, the, the paint chips, each of them have something that says the line of paint that it comes from, like, um, now I don't remember, vintage something or coastal classics or something. And that narrows down the paint chips to like, there's about 12 or 15 of them. It's much easier to find the one you're looking for. Then I first walked up and I'm like, oh my gosh, there's a thousand paint chips here. How am I going to find this? But uh, so just look on the back for the line of colors that it comes from. Um, so I did that on Sunday and then I came home and I went through my stash and I have complained about my stash in the past as even though I like the fabrics, I've gotten rid of the fabrics that I don't care for. I just don't feel it works together well. Like who knew there could be so many shades of blue or red or pink, you know, <laughs> like they don't always go together. But um, this quilt along is, is enabling me to pull from my own stash. And I actually had fabric in each of these colorways. The one that I did the have the hardest time with was the paint chip called Scandia, which is interesting because it's my favorite color of all the paint chips. It's um, a little bit of a grayish blue, kind of a, a Scandinavian blue, and I love it, but I realized that I didn't have very much in my stash for that. I might supplement a little bit there, but the rest of it I actually had stuff for, so I pulled those. Um, one, not quite yet because they don't look good, but one of these days I'll take a picture of it, and I think I'm going to start. If I do this, I'll print out the clues each week, and um, upon Bonnie's suggestion in her blog post, I'm going to make half the number of units that she's telling you to. She makes very large bed quilts and I make throw size quilts. And I think half will not quite be enough, but it will be, um, an, you know, it'll be enough to know, you know, to see what it looks like. Then I can go back and figure out how many more of each unit I need. So, so let me know if you're doing the Bonnie Hunter mystery quilt or if you've done one in the past. Um, I'm, I'm kind of excited about it this year. Let's move on to books. One of the things I'm excited about with our Facebook group is for you guys to be able to share books that you're reading with me <laughs> instead of always the other way around because, you know, I like I like hearing what other people are reading. Um, I'm still in my audiobook thing and I, just, I keep re-listening to Louise Penny books. The one I just re-listened to while I did all that sewing uh, the last couple of weeks is called The Brutal Telling. And that's a really good one. Um, and I know because I've been through the series before that it kind of leaks into the next one in the series. And so I looked for that, but that is not available as an audiobook. So I'm a little bummed about that. So then I moved on to um, Signature of All Things by Elizabeth Gilbert. And I'm not, I'm not recommending that yet because I'm only about... Um, I don't know, less than 20% in, you like how we talk about books when they're audiobooks or Kindle books, like in percentages, instead of like, oh, I'm about a quarter of the way through. I'm 21%. Um, and that has been interesting for a couple of reasons. One, I recently talked about listening to her book, Big Magic, and 
in and that's a book about creativity and in that book she talks about how she kind of you know gets obsessed she gets interested in things and then she goes around the world and she researches them and then sometimes they turn into um, non-fiction books sometimes they turn into fiction books so she got a little bit obsessed with botany I know from listening to Big Magic and this novel is the result of that it's how she took all that knowledge and turned it into a novel and so I've been enjoying it um, I'm not very far in it's getting a little bit racy so I'm not a hundred percent sure that it's got my recommendation yet so I'm gonna give it a little bit more so we'll kind of see I can be kind of a prude I will let you know that but uh, so so I'm listening to a signature of all things I tried going back to uh, the Outlander series because I never finished the series um, so I went back to book five and I started reading it thinking, have you read this book? This seems really familiar. Well, what has happened is I think I've started that book several times because I would like to finish that series, but I cannot get traction. It's called The Fiery Cross. And maybe I just need to push through more than, say, 10% through the book. <laughs> um, that was my first time of using the Libby app to not do an audio book, but to do an ebook. And um, you can choose to read it in the Libby app or in the kin in the Kindle app. I actually chose the Libby app, which was just kind of a bit of a different experience, um, which was fine. But yeah, it's, um, you know, it ret it self returned before I could even I even got any traction on that one. So I don't know, let me know if I think it's I think there's seven books in the Outlander series. So you know, let me know if you've gotten through books five, six and seven, and if it's worth pushing through for me, because I'm not 100% sure about that. The other book that I have not read, but I am excited about is, do you know the book Simple Abundance? Here, I've got my copy that I got at a, like a use at a library um, sale one time. It's right here next to me. It's called Simple Abundance, A Day Book of Comfort and Joy by Sarah Ban, I never can say this, uh, Brethnuk. I'm not sure I'm saying, I'm probably not saying that right. Anyways, this book came out, I don't know, like 20 or 25 years ago. And it's, it's, it's a fun read. It's just kind of appreciating everyday life type of a thing. And it's a day book, meaning that um, almost like a devotional where, you know, there's it starts January 1st. So whatever day of the month it is, month and year, you just open it up to, you know, November 4th or whatever it is. And there is a new edition of that coming out, I guess, in celebration of whatever the anniversary it is, um, kind of an updated for the new millennium one. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I'm going to put that on my uh, Christmas list. One of the kids can maybe get it for me, but I've always enjoyed that book. So I, I'm sure that I will enjoy um, the new, the new version. In terms of shows, I've got a few to talk about there. And I, I realized as I was making this little, I was jotting down some notes and as I was making this list and I was thinking, oh my gosh, people are going to think I sit around all day and watch TV. And I do not, I promise you. <laughs> <laughs> but I do watch things while I'm sewing and, uh, and my husband and I, um, you know, we have our shows that we watch together. So the one that, uh, we blew through very quickly cause I think it's only eight episodes is Goliath. That's on Amazon prime. It is Billy Bob Thornton as a very tortured alcoholic lawyer <laughs> who lives and works out of a motel room. I can't even remember why. I think this is season three. Um, but this was a really weird season. I got, it got a little, if you, do you remember Twin Peaks? Did you watch Twin Peaks in the nineties? It had a very Twin Peaks feel. And part of that reason is because Sherilyn Fenn, who was in Twin Peaks, was in this. Um, but my husband and I kept looking at each other going, the other seasons weren't like this, right? This is really weird. It had this weird kind of surreal mystical feel to it. So it, it also had kind of a star studded cast. It has, and well, Billy Bob Thornton plays, um, I don't know why it's called Goliath. I guess, I don't know why it's called Goliath. <laughs> I really don't. His name is not Goliath. His name is Billy something. Um, and it has um, Dennis, it had Dennis Quaid in it and it had, um, Amy Brennanman, who, if you remember, she was on that show Judging Amy years ago, and I'm stalling because I can't think of the other guy's name, Bo, Bo Bridges. So they um, were, you know, characters for this season, which was kind of fun. So it was very good. It was super weird, um, but it's only eight episodes, and, and we had a good time with it. And now we're on to Jack Ryan, which um, stars John Krasinski, 
who is Jim from The Office, except for it is like Jim from The Office 2.0 because he is like totally ripped. He's totally buffed out. He's like a little, he's a little, that sounds so demeaning. He's an action hero in this one. You know, it's a Tom Clancy deal. Um, I barely can follow the storyline because it has a lot to do with, you know, all this international espionage and stuff, but it doesn't matter. It's very, very enjoyable show. So we're about halfway through that. Again, not very many episodes. I don't even know. There's probably 10. Um, so that's what I'm kind of watching with my husband. So we, we kind of watch those shows together on my own when I'm sewing or knitting or just, you know, hiding out. I finished Poldark, the, the, which is the season ender. I don't know if, I don't know if I finished that since my, the last podcast, but I finished that and I love Poldark. So I started it over. <laughs> now, this is the girl who has literally watched Downton Abbey beginning to end five times you know, and who keeps listening to Inspector Gamache um, stories. So, um, and it's been very interesting to go back because I, I think it's, I don't know, maybe five seasons. I'm not really sure, but there's a lot of little hints dropped in that first season for what you, what will end up happening later that, you know, will totally go over your head if, if you're not rewatching it. So I've really enjoyed that. Um, I don't know if I will really watch it all the way through, but if, if I'm kind of, um, it, it's the perfect show for sewing or even knitting where, you know, I just mostly listen to it. And so I like rewatching that. Oh, speaking of which, and I'm sorry, I don't have your name, but I got an email um, from a listener who also likes to um, just rewatch shows when, she, you know, when she's crafting so that you, you know, you don't really miss anything. And she watches Lost. And so we need to talk about Lost at some point. Um, and I think I need to do a rewatch of Lost. Um, that is an aside though. So still plugging along with this is us. So I don't know if you've watched that, but you totally should this season, you know, it's good. We're just like in the middle of it. It's not as so it's not as heart wrenching as it used to be. We're just kind of digging in on the characters, but totally, totally enjoyable. Um, another thing that just came out recently, and I've only watched a couple episodes of the new season is a million little things that's on Hulu. Well, I watch on a Hulu, which probably means it's on a real channel. We don't get real TV. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's been really fun. That's, I talked about, um, the first season on a, on a earlier podcast, but a million little things is kind think kind of like, um, the big chill. It's an ensemble cast group of adult friends who, um, are rallying around because one of the friends has committed suicide. And so it's just the whole fallout from that and all the different relationship tangles and um, secrets revealed. It's funny. I was just finishing up watching an episode um, on the couch one day. My husband came down and um, he just, he watched like the last five minutes with it, with me. And it just made me realize it, it's totally not his kind of show, but like every storyline is so earnest. Like there's just, there's this like, you know, every, every character has some sort of a heart wrenching storyline. <laughs> like may you never be friends with these people because God knows what's going to happen to you. But uh, so it's definitely, it's, it's hyper emotional, but um, you know, and definitely a tear jerker, but I, I really, I really enjoy that. And then one day, um, before Jack Ryan came out, uh, my husband and I were looking for something to watch. He comes home for lunch. So we often uh, watch a show then. And I'd heard good things about a show called Modern Love. It is, I think it's a Netflix original. I, don't quote me on that. And I've actually only watched one episode. He said he's heard about um, the show and that apparently it's quite star studded because it's, um, it's, I think it's episodic. It's like each each show, I think, is just a whole new cast of characters, which kind of reminds me of like, I don't know, Love American style from when I was a kid. But um, we watched the first one and I cried and I loved it. Absolutely loved it. And I was singing its praises in one of my Instagram stories. And somebody messaged me and said that she binged the whole season, like like maybe in a day. <laughs> I don't know. And that the first episode and the last episodes were the best, but they were all they were all good. So I'm looking forward to, to watching more of those, too. Let's move on to homemaking. The holidays are upon us, people. As I record this, this is November. I have hosted Thanksgiving the last two years with extended family, meaning my brothers and their families and my dad. Um, it's just my dad coming this year. And I got to say, um, I'm, I'm on some level, you know, 
I just, I love to have the whole house full like that. And it's frankly really fun to have, you know, help with the cooking and all that. But it's not the worst thing in the world to have it a little bit toned down this year. Although the last couple of years I have like really, I went into like deep cleaning mode, you know, before I had a bunch of people coming to my house. And this year, because of the whole declutter fly lady system, I don't even have to do that. So there's part of me that was like, man, I was totally set to host a Thanksgiving this year. <laughs> But my dad's coming, so that so that'll be fun. The one thing I wanted to talk about, um, I don't know if you're hosting or whatever you're doing for, well, in the U.S., we've got Thanksgiving coming, and then, of course, that goes right into um, Christmas season or Hanukkah or whatever you're, you're celebrating. Some Everybody celebrates something, right? So I wanted to talk a little bit about... Um, my holiday binder. Now, this is something that I got the idea from, from the fly lady. Um, in 2005, I looked back at how far my, my uh, holiday control journal goes back. It's 2005. So with that, 14 years. But I've used it faithfully every single year. So what it is, what my holiday binder is, I'm going to lean down and grab it. It's on the floor here. It is a place where um, I keep everything that I need so I don't have to dig for information at the holidays. So I've got, um, and I've got little, you know, tab dividers between it. And this is nothing pretty. As a matter of fact, I did pick a red, or it's like a burgundy binder um, because it seemed festive and it's completely falling apart now. I need to, to replace it. Um, everything's just handwritten. It's like no big deal. Like, um, so I've got these dividers with, you know, little pockets. Like my, here's in the Thanksgiving one, it says Thanksgiving 2004. So that was actually 15 years ago. Um, back in those days when I was more, you know, kind of getting my feet as a, as a homemaker and as a mom and a potential host, we were trying different things every Thanksgiving, you know, like the way we did the turkey, what, you know, the size and, um, you know, the side dishes. So in here I have all the recipes um, that I use at Thanksgiving and some of them that I don't use anymore, frankly, because we've moved on. And I have a page for exactly what we had so for, for every Thanksgiving. So here's like two Thanksgiving 2008 menus. Classic turkey, garlic mashed potatoes, stuffing, gravy, apple salad, cranberry sauce, green bean casserole, so original, right? Candied yams, crown of rolls, pumpkin streusel pie, sparkling apple cider, and wine. And so I just kept track of those every year um, until we completely settled on a menu. And I think actually that is what we settled on. That's the that's the most recent one I have. Um, so we've been doing that for 11 years, people. So then the next section is everything for all the Christmas menu stuff. So same thing for, um, we do soup on Christmas Eve. So it's got the soup recipes in here. It's got the overnight monkey bread, you know, to have on Christmas morning. Um, all the cookie recipes are, are in here and, and some things that I don't make very often, but like here's some spiced nuts, um, our fudge recipe that I shared last year. Um, something that we call Christmas crack which is that um, thing with salting crackers and you pour, you know, this mixture of butter and um, brown sugar, melted brown sugar on top of it. And then you um, cook it and then you put um, chocolate chips on top and then they melt and then you just break it up. And it's this, this crazy good thing, even though the ingredients sound totally weird. So I've got all of those um, recipes in there. And again, all the menus that we've done for Christmas Eve and Christmas morning and Christmas dinner. So I just don't have to hunt for anything, which has been really nice. I've actually made copies of recipes to keep in here from cookbooks or other, you know, they exist in other places too, but they, they're in here. Um, my third section here is Christmas gifts, and I can go back to Christmas 2006 and tell you everything I have bought for anybody ever for Christmas. Every kid has a page in here. <laughs> <laughs> or for what we got them, how much it cost. You know, I even have check little, and again, it's just like, it's, it's just no, uh, just notebook paper that I've just kind of scribbled on there. And, um, whether I've, you know, ordered it, received it, wrapped it, um, you know, what Santa was getting them, um, what's all the little things that we put in the, not everything, but a lot of the stuff we put in the stockings, which is kind of fun to look back on, um, to get ideas, you know, for the stocking. The next section is Christmas cards and it's got, it doesn't have the addresses, but it has the names of everybody that we send Christmas cards to. Um, again, since 
I don't know, what does this go back to? I don't know, about 10 years, I think. So I love this binder. I use it every year and um, it just, it's very nice to keep everything all in one place. So that is my, my homemaking tip this year is to consider putting together a holiday journal. I know this podcast episode is running a little bit long, so I um, just want to finish up with a, a couple last things. Um, if you are planning for the holidays, and we're here at the beginning of November, we've got some weeks before the holidays hit us, you might consider 15 minutes a day working on holiday things that stress you out. For me, I make a family calendar that has photographs of my family and my brother's families and it's what I give my dad every year and I love doing it but it kind of stresses me out it just it takes time um, you know you have to go through and pick the pictures and get them to send you pictures which they actually did very quickly this year um, and once I get into it it's fine but it's a hard thing for me to get motivated to start so my goal for this week is to spend 15 minutes a day on that project and I know that once I get going it'll be done in no time. Christmas cards stress me out too um, so it's the same kind of deal. I like to get them done early so my goal really it's beginning of November now I really want my that calendar done before the end of before we even get into December by the end of the month. Um, I can't get my Christmas cards done because I need my kids to come home for Thanksgiving so I could take a good picture of them but uh, so whatever that is for you whether it's cleaning or or um, getting people to send you, you know, Christmas lists, getting online, doing a little bit of um, shopping or whatever, just 15 minutes a day. Man, I have, if there's anything I've learned recently is that 15 minutes a day adds up. So that about does it for this episode. I don't think there are any new reviews this week. Wah, wah. <laughs> So if you feel so inclined, uh, please go to iTunes or Google Play or wherever you listen to the podcast, Stitcher, whatever, and leave a rating or review. I really appreciate it. It really helps other people find the podcast. So um, if you feel so inclined to do that or share with a friend, I would completely appreciate that. Thanks for spending this time with me. Go over, join the Facebook group so that we can get this conversation going two directions, people. And uh, I hope you've had a lovely time with your lovely beverage. And uh, we'll see you next time. <laughs>